Walter van Wijk. Ik ben Van het Sip. Um, we hebben vandaag een webinar Ethiek met als titel Smart Cities and Ethics. Um, deze webinar is uh, niet alleen een losstaande webinar, hoewel die prima zo te beluisteren en aan de, deel te nemen is. Uh, het is ook een onderdeel van onze masterclass ethiek die we vanuit SIP uh, hebben uh, bedacht. Eigenlijk vanuit de domeingroep ethiek. En de hele masterclass bestaat uit drie webinars, waarvan dit de eerste is, en ook drie podcasts. Ze vullen elkaar aan, maar ze zijn ook afzonderlijk te bekijken en te beluisteren zoals je al op de slide kan lezen. Uh, vandaag gaat het over Smart Cities and Ethics met Piek Visser Knijf van Filosofie en Actie. Uh, Michael Nagenborg, Michael Nagenborg van de Universiteit Twente. Ik draag bij deze het stokje over uh, aan Alex Korra, de voorzitter van onze domeingroep Ethiek. En uh, dit waren denk ik ook de laatste woorden in het Nederlands, want Alex neemt het over in het Engels. Yes, well, I want to welcome everybody to this webinar and uh, in particular uh, Michael and Piek. And uh, we'll be focusing today on uh, the ethical aspects of uh, smart city technology. And uh, here I would like to give the floor to uh, Michael Nagenborg uh, from the University of Twente, Department of Philosophy, or uh, sorry, the Department of Technology and Public Policy and uh, the Section of Philosophy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alex, for the nice introduction. So um, here we go. I um, will talk a little bit about the ethics of smart cities and the responsibility of municipalities. Um, maybe a bit of a background. So I'm involved in this NWO funded project called Bridging Data and the Built Environment, uh, for short, BRIGHT. And that is concerned with the MX3D bridge that just has been opened in Amsterdam this year. Um, and this links nicely to what we want to discuss today because the bridge has two dimensions. On the one hand, uh, it's this wonderful street construction, but there are also a a lot of sensors inside and my project, uh, our project is actually about making sense of this data and especially also in, uh, to understand how the ordinary users, citizens, tourists react to this kind of smart city technology in practice. So having said that, uh, you might get a better understanding why I focus very much on the technological design perspective in my talk. Uh, so, um, while Peak later on will more focus on how it feels like from the side of the municipalities. Now, what I want to do, wait a minute, I have to go one back, yeah. So first of all, I would like to talk briefly about common ethical challenges of smart city projects. Then I will relate my general considerations to our specific case, the MX3D bridge. And then I will uh, sum up my talk by asking, okay, what can municipalities do? And uh, between the different parts, you always have the opportunities to ask questions. So uh, always contact uh, Alex via chat if you have anything that you would like to know. So what are the common ethical challenges of smart city projects? So first of all, I uh, prefer to speak about smart cities in plural, because there's not only one smart city, but, but there are different ways of a city to become smart. And actually, uh, I also have my reservations when it comes to the overall term of, this, uh, of the smart city. So it was quite popular or made popular by IBM Smart uh, Planners uh, campaign in 2009. Uh, but actually, if you look into the history of technology, there are also a lot of predecessors. So, for example, the cluster analysis in uh, Los Angeles is often seen as one of the starting points of the current discussions. In the Dutch co uh, context, of course, we need to talk about Amsterdam's digital city. Um, but yeah, it's a bit hard to say when actually uh, smart cities start. Um, however, I'm much more interested in what happened after the cooperative push um, in the early 90s, uh, early 2000s. So, because there was a lot of critique of this idea that you can buy in a city operation system off the shelf. Uh, and uh, so we see a lot of municipalities going now in different direction, trying a less centralized and more localized approach to making cities smart. Uh, so even up to the point that not all smart city initiatives aim for developing a uniform data infrastructure. So for example, uh, to take the example of Amsterdam, as far as I know, there is no centralized data hub or any data infrastructure which allows to share data across the various projects. So this is a very different kind of approach to a smart city than, let's say, what we see with uh, Sidewalks Labs Toronto Waterfront project. They basically have one big company 
redesigning a whole data infrastructure and a whole environment according to its own needs. So please be in mind when we talk about the ethics of smart cities, uh, Toronto waterfront is something to pay attention to, but it's not something that's really typical. So in to that extent, I always like to speak about smart city projects rather than smart cities or a smart city. Now, um, I'm perfectly aware that not all smart city initiatives are technologically driven. Uh, there are even some good examples which focus on intergenerational learning without big emphasis on anything computer related. However, for the purpose of this talk, I would like to focus on smart city projects that include sensors, that include um, big data and therefore AI as typical ingredients. And if you accept this kind of premise, then, and you do share my background in computer ethics, then actually it's not a surprise that, that we will come across, uh, across common ethical challenges that are often coming up when it comes to digital technologies. So privacy, uh, trust, and responsibility, especially when AI gets into the mix, there's often a question about, okay, who exactly is responsible for this kind of outcome? Is this trustworthy? Um, can we actually outsource decision making to machines? Can we think about new kinds of human machine uh, teams here and the like? But all of that is not really particular for smart city projects. So there's been a wonderful paper by Mark Ryan and Anja Bergogi that came out in 2019 that looked into some smart city projects. Um, and uh, indeed, they identified yeah, the common topics that I just introduced, so, uh, but in specific variations. So they say privacy and data ownership is, is a big thing in multiple cities. Uh, trust, often in, co in connection with transparency, is a reoccurring subject. Um, there's also the question of accuracy of recommendations. So how can we build, make our decision making, making depend on this kind of system? So the question of responsibility is there. And they introduce also one new topic, and that is economic implications. And um, here I would like to go a little bit more deeper um, because it's something that I can also strongly relate to our own project. So when we talk about economic implications, they are mostly interested in the kind of conflicts of interest and biases that might be introduced through the way that uh, smart city projects have been organized so far. Uh, so they say there's a clear bias uh, because tech companies try to sell technology, which focus on technological solutions rather than on political or social solutions. And of, uh, there's also a uh, rather interesting pressure coming from the mere fact that uh, we succeeded in framing everything smart city. I mean, who wants to be a dump city? So there is an almost an instantaneous need of cities to compete, become smarter and smarter, and therefore introduce more and more technology. What I also would like to add here is uh, that there is a problem also with selling out and outsourcing services. Those are meaningful private-public partnerships. Uh, which can have a very practical risk that is uh, becoming dependent on private companies and private partners and their solutions, even up to the point of a lock in where you no longer can make any uh, other meaningful uh, decisions about alternatives because you're simply stuck with the system that you have. And as a philosopher, I would like to add there's also a conceptual risk uh, that is reducing the city to a service provider. So, of course, there are services that can be improved, but that, that doesn't mean that the political unity of the city can be reduced to just the services that are being provided to the citizens. And I think that is one of the inherent risks that we need to become aware of, that uh, the discussion on smart cities might change our understanding of what a city is. Okay, before I move to a specific case, Alex, are there any uh, specific questions that came up already? No, not at the moment. Okay, so I assume everything is clear so far which would be nice. So if I look into our specific case of the MX3D bridge, um, we can clearly see that there's a question about privacy and data ownership. Um, so what you see here is a sketch that uh, uh, shows what we plan to do, namely using skeletonizing software uh, for the video cameras that we need in order to do the machine learning training on the object. So the idea is on the long run, uh, we will be able to uh, see what is going on on the bridge based on the pressure uh, moments of yeah, caused by users on the bridge. However, in the beginning, we will need some 
video footage in order to, uh, to, to train the systems and uh, in order to minimize uh, or, uh, or be privacy sensitive, we will use this kind of skeletonization software so that you only will see stick men or women walking around on the bridge rather than real people. So um, we do our best to minimize privacy invasions and we would like to claim that we are uh, compliant with all legal aspects. However, what about the moral right to collect data and analyze data in public space? Who has the right to decide what data is being collected and what uh, and how can we object to data collections? What are the, actually the uh, opportunities that users might have in order to say, hey, actually, I don't want that. So you see um, that there are a lot of uh, concerns around privacy that are very hard to address. And that is also leading to one of the first questions that I will also address in more detail, and that is, how can people know that the data is being collected? Um, so this closely relates to the question of trust and transparency. And here uh, we thought, okay, uh, there's an odd thing about IoT technology in urban spaces because the idea is that you do not recognize what there is a sensor. Actually, the technology should be completely in the background. That is what's so cool, is so cool about it. But that also means that citizens and other users cannot really have a discussion about what is going on there. So they need to be informed. And here's where things get really, really complicated. Uh, because uh, if you remember the good old sign, this area is under video surveillance. We're entering an age where it's much more complicated to explain to people what, uh, what is happening here. So uh, we had a nice uh, BA thesis by Naomi von Strahlen, who looked into designing just a sign for the bridge. And that's actually what she came up with in the end to, uh, to yeah, have a meaningful starting point for a discussion with citizens about what is going on on the specific object and what kind of data we are collecting and where to contact us and the like. Um, this is actually uh, would have been our preferred uh, solution, uh, which includes all the information that you need on the sensors and who is involved and the like. But you see, um, in a moment where you're entering in a, a smart city where you have multiple of this project, it becomes very, very hard to yeah, put all the information in the public space. And it would be very unpractical if you would always include everything that people uh, should need. So while I cannot give you a good answer to the question about who actually should be able to negotiate um, in, uh, about data in public space, uh, there's clearly a question about how to get this discussion started in the first place. Um, and here I would like allow myself a short uh, side remark. I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about this talk about data ownership. Um, because it always assumes that um, ownership is a solution to the privacy uh, problem. I don't think so. Privacy, in a very uh, broad sense, also means just this is none of your business. Don't watch me. Don't take track on me. Um, but it has nothing to do uh, with the question if I regard my data to be my own or something to be shared. Uh, actually, um, even uh, Brandeis and Warren in their first paper on privacy said, okay, Copyright is actually not the issue here because in the moment where you talk about data ownership, it actually means you could even transfer the ownership rights. So that doesn't really solve the thing. Nevertheless, um, that is my, uh, just a side remark here because the way that it is currently framed in political and ethical discussions is often the question about data ownership. Okay, so before I move to my last part, again, a question to Alex. Any questions? Yes, there was one question, or uh, actually two, but one I would like to start with. Yeah. What did participants in the project think about the amount of text that was on the info board? Was there any kind of testing with a testing group or were uh, citizens involved uh, in the decision or, or feedback testing? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Actually, we had a, a series of workshops where we first tried to understand um, what citizens actually would like to know about the project. So, what uh, do they? want to know in order to make a meaningful decision about this. Um, but in the end, it was a very practical question about how much do we need to provide and how much do we want to provide. And it actually was, um, yeah, then concluded that we only need a very small sign. Uh, and then we ended up with a solution that is not in line with our own research, actually. But uh, again, uh, for our own project, we focus very much on trying to understand what citizens would like to know how to transfer this message and also how to clearly transfer this message. And, and was there, uh, is there any data or any sense of uh, on the gap between what 
citizens want to know and what was actually on it and also what was on it what what should have been the best solution in your uh, from a theoretical standpoint but the interesting thing is that the legal requirements and actually is something i will come back to later are very minimal um so you don't have to provide that much information while citizens often would like to know uh, who's collecting the data for what purpose will i get something out of this uh, what are the benefits for other people um and but that is not a strict requirement and uh, i find that interesting and may, maybe also worthwhile a discussion uh, to have okay uh, one more question and then we can move on to um, the next set uh, session or the next section sorry yeah um it was a question about uh, uh did you somehow uh, um, take into account the implication of people needing to cross a bridge but uh, yeah, uh, not being able to use an alternative. So um, uh, in, in practice, I know this bridge is in an area where there are lots of other bridges, but yeah. uh, how did you relate with this to this issue? Actually, we, we, we paid quite some attention to it. Uh, and there is a prototype of the bridge where you uh, actually can um, either uh, use uh, the bridge or you use a kind of a handrail where you can just uh, swing over it and then you won't leave any print, uh, footprints. But that obviously only worked for the, for the prototype. Um, but indeed, in practical terms, for this particular project, we said, okay, because there are multiple bridges around, we don't think it's a major issue here. Uh, but indeed, uh, that is one of the most general challenges in doing IoT in the public space. Uh, there is often not an easy opt out, and that makes things really, really different, I would say. So, uh, uh, even if we would argue, well, you don't have to use certain web services and the like, uh, you, you have to go through the city. And of course, what is also interesting with this particular project is that there's a lot of surveillance operations going on already from different a, uh, agencies, mostly for security related purposes, which people not, not are aware of. So we also have this uh, odd position where, because we try to be very open about it, that we, of course, then also stimulate a lot of questions around it. By the way, data collection does not happen on the bridge yet. I uh, probably forgot that in the beginning. Okay, can we move on? Yes, yeah, otherwise we may get a bit short in time. Yes. Yeah, we don't want that. So, so my final bit, I want um, to focus a little bit on the role of the municipalities and local authorities. Um, and maybe I should start with what I'm saying here at the bottom of my slide. Um, I don't think that cities are doing a terrible job. I don't want to complain. I see this more as a challenge that does exist and where we do need to think a little bit harder. Um, also outside uh, the people in the municipalities doing a good job, what role and meaning the city should have in this discussion on smart cities, because it's often not that clear. Now, when it comes to the special role and responsibility of municipalities, I argued in a paper uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that cities should take lead because they are often the initiators or the clients of smart city projects. Uh, meanwhile, I think that problems are even more complicated. Uh, on the one hand, often technological developments happen without the cities playing a role here, but rather uh, there is a service emerging uh, that raises questions about what a city should do. And uh, so using the standard examples, Uber, for example, uh, might become part of your transportation system. And then, of course, for the standpoint of a municipality, the question is, so what now for my urban and transportation planning? Should I uh, rely on Uber? Uh, they're providing a great service for the moment, but is that enough uh, to allow me to cut down on public transport? Or think about Airbnb, uh, which, of course, is still a big uh, discussion and troublemaker and uh, yeah, has a very important relationship with the existing housing market. Uh, but these are all projects that are built on digitalization strategies that influence the life in a city and uh, therefore challenge the questions towards uh, municipalities about how to, to address them. And finally, I already mentioned this more conceptual risk that uh, I would like to see cities become more political again, to think about them more as uh, local authorities rather than service providers. And, there's something very inherent in the smart dis uh, city discourse that sells technology as a neutral tool that helps you to improve your services. And one of the biggest risks I see is that cities reduce themselves to service providers, and that shouldn't be happening. So that is why I would like cities to become more active in this domain. Now, based on what I just uh, presented, 
I would like to like to suggest some very mundane things. Um, so first of all, we need interfaces. It's often quite hard for technological projects to figure out who is actually your contact point for smart city projects in a city. And uh, there often are multiple parts that need to be involved for one project. So it would be good to have just one clear entry point not only for particular reasons, but also in order to make it easier to implement smart city project policies with inner city. I also would be considering local data infrastructures. So if you do not provide a local data economy, projects will use other alternatives. Data might go somewhere. And again, it's a bit of a mixed bag here, I understand, but if you have the centralized data, platform but of course also raises all kinds of questions but if you do not really offer something like this um you will lose control uh, and that might also become a problem so but i'm curious to see a little on the discussion what you think about it. second um cities should think about how to inform citizens in a more or less standardized format and also ask uh, smart city projects provide this information in a more or less standardized form so providing templates for on-site uh, on information would be great uh, just to make clear what uh, needs to be known and of course ask your citizens ask city users ask what people really would like to know and then make clear uh, make sure that this information is being provided in that regard i also like the idea of public registers for sensors and algorithms because what we are dealing with here is, a, uh, like I said before, a technology that is meant to be invisible. So we need to make it visible again, at least for the people who would like to know. Now, this looks like very practical, very mundane uh, things that a city could do. Uh, and uh, of course, I do not mind implementing also more on policy level, or implementing more on ethic review uh, committees. But I think it's also important just to keep in mind that we're often these simple things really help us to make it a responsible transition to the smart city okay and with this i would like to conclude to leave a little bit room for questions and answers and please feel free to ask me now or later on in the session okay i think i have two interesting questions we can do and then we can move on to peak okay. um, uh, the first one is, should municipalities be making more, much more risk-based policies before they get started? What risk does uh, do municipalities uh, need to uh, address and, uh, and, and, uh, and what kind of risks do the municipalities themselves or the uh, inhabitants uh, face? Should they be more aware of this risk and make more risk-type analysis of this uh, mm -hmm. issue? I mean, in general, when, when you do a risk-based uh approach always ask yourself is this risk unreversible so can i could, can i uh, still stop the project or not um because it only makes for, for me it uh, would be more reasonable to think about most smart city projects as something that still can be stopped that can be put on hold so they don't pose a major threat in that regard other than that i think it's a nice idea to think about in terms of risk uh, of course always the question is who benefits and who is bearing the risk um and my proposal would be uh, to think about who, yeah, who benefits from the technology, who pays the price, because it's often not the same group that is paying the price in terms of privacy uh, than the one who is, that is benefiting ab about it. Think about uh, what kind of problems are being addressed, uh, closely monitor um, if all citizens benefit from it in the, to the same degree. So for example, uh, we know from uh, studies in Belgium, uh, if you offer citizens a possibility to um, uh, report damages in the public environment via smartphones, it will mostly benefit rich people. It's, it's a rich neighborhood that use this technology, not a poor neighborhood. So I have a close eye on, uh, on justice issues, I would say, when it comes to this kind of risk assessment. Okay, thank you. One um, um, final question, perhaps, and, and that was focused on, uh, are there any lessons learned from previous uh, uh, projects, for instance, from SAIL uh, 20, uh, the one last SAIL uh, uh, edition? And mm -hmm. is there something you can mention quickly where you said, yeah, this was a, a, a good lesson that was uh, learned? Um, I mean, the lessons that we learned from our projects, um, 
For example, for me, it was important to understand that it's not only about uh, creating transparency, making things visible, but also to think about the political process that might follow up on it. So that you not only know what is going on, but that you actually can do something with information. But in general, I think there's an interesting structural challenge here to uh, create this more of this kind of learning communities where we can learn from each other uh, so that the insights that we get from one project do not get lost. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Then uh, I would like to um, give the floor to uh, Piek uh, fischer Kneif. Uh, she is the owner of Philosophy in Action, and she helped uh, the municipality of Eindhoven develop an ethical framework for smart city projects. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Alex, again, and also Michael for your inspiring talk and, and uh, sharing your insights. Um, as uh, Alex introduced me, um, uh, I'm the owner of Philosophy in, Axi, Philosophy in Action, and I advise uh, private and public or organizations to create a sound and feasible data ethics strategy within the organization and make data ethics works. Work And in this talk, I will introduce the options of implement implementing data ethics for reflecting on smart city uh, technology. And I will use the case of the municipality of Eindhoven as an example. Um, so I will talk about the ethical reflection, the processes with it, the municipality, and also the interplay with the data protection impact assessment. Because we don't want to do double work, do we? So first of all, I would like to go into the term smart city and Michael addressed it as well. Um, I put smart uh, between quotation marks because I, I'm really critical of the term. But as Michael addressed as well, um, I talk about smart city technology. So basically every digitization project is, in my opinion, a smart city technology. So what kind of digitization projects we talk about? Well, we talk about applying data and te technology to traditional surf services or objects or process processes to enhance efficiency and convenience. Um, and the Rathenau Institute uh, did a couple of researches on smart city technology and on smart city technology and municipalities. And they make a distinction between three kinds of digitization project trends within municipalities. And I find it very useful, useful so I would like to introduce them to you. The first one is uh, public services. So um, uh, municipalities face uh, transitions in public services. Think of uh, transitions in contacts with citizens, but also uh, the possibility of creating uh, app uh, to apply for licenses online, but also online tools uh, when it comes to child care and preventing uh, death counseling, for example. So the public services are um, transitioning into uh, a digitization um, project or projects. The second one is public space. So technology or data is used Within the public space, think of cameras, crowd control, sensors, drones, uh, traffic control. And the other one is one that Michael already mentioned, and which is kind of a, um, uh, well, it's uh, beyond the boundaries of the municipality, but it infects the, uh, uh, the city uh, um, uh, in great matter. It's the category that Verata now calls elsewhere in the society. And they mean uh, consequences from platform economy, uh, uh, for example, but also by choices by citizens or companies who, for example, um, uh, use sensors or cameras themselves. So think of the impact of Airbnb or uh, the availability of so-called uh, shared uh, mopeds or autopads. These are three kinds of digitization trends that municipalities face, and also the municipality of Eindhoven face these kinds of technology and transitions. So um, the council of the city of Eindhoven, they asked for uh, a couple of things, and that's where I got involved. So the, the council of Eindhoven, they uh, wanted to have um, some tools in order to have a constructive dialogue on ethics when it comes to digitization projects. So they asked for setting up an ethical committee 
in order to give advice on complex ethical questions and issues that comes along with digitization projects. They asked for uh, an ethical framework along which um, a good conversation can uh, be held and also to set up a procedure for ethical reflection. So I'm involved since November 2020 as an external consultant and I consult the strategy department of the municipality and I will show you our design. But please note that this is still a proposal, so um, the Council has not yet agreed upon. We're actually in the middle of that process. Uh, so the design took months. Um, we started dialogues with several sectors within the municipalities. We started learning from others, like uh, all kinds of other municipalities, cities are dealing with the same issues. Uh, we did research, validation ses sessions, and also consultation of the Council working group. So I developed this um, whole trajectory together with the strategy policy advisor, advisor Maart van Veen from the municipality of Eindhoven. And I would like to show you the essence of the data ethics reflection. And please note that this is uh, on a project level, the procedure to have a good conversation about the ethical impl implementation, the ethical impl <laughs> implication of a digitization of a new digitization project. So of course there are many tools at hand and you might know them, for example, DIDA, uh, Begeleidingsethik, uh, the Data Ethics Canvas, lots of impact assessment also for algorithms. Uh, and in my work for the municipality of Eindhoven, um, we focused on ethics as a dialogue. So it's not a tick the box, it's not working off a list, but of course we needed to make and design a procedure how to have a constructive dialogue on the ethical implications. Um, so basically it comes up to three basic questions, but you will see that it's, it's got a lot more, uh, you have to do a lot more than only ask those three questions, but it's the beginning. And actually I got these questions from the uh, DPO from the uh, municipality of Utrecht. He told me these three questions a couple of years ago, and I've been working with them ever since. His name is Hans van Impelen. So thank you, Hans, again. The first question you need to ask is, is this possible? So there is a new project. And of course, we want to gain more insight into the possibilities and limitations all into the technology. So how does it work? What are the limitations? Uh, do we understand the technology fully? Uh, how does it fit in the in the already uh, in the infrastructure we have? So this is a technical question. It's about the technical possibilities and also limitations of the technology we would like to use. And the second question you need to ask is: Is it allowed? So new technology is also always bound to legal frameworks, agreements, and covenants. What laws and regulations should be considered? Think of the uni the Declaration of the Universal Universal Declaration of the Human Rights at the GDPR and uh, other regulations and laws. And then the last uh, question is basically about ethics. It's a desirability question and it's at the core of the conversation. But it's important to realize that the technical question and the question about the laws have uh, ethical uh, implications. So they influence the desirability of the project. Of course, if the technology has limitations, then it influences the outcomes and it influences the city. So in the de desirability question, um, we take the interests of the stakeholders into account and we re relate them to the aims of the proposal and the public values that it would like to achieve. So I would now go into the desirability question. And I think it's very good um, to know and to be aware of uh, the tech goggles you might get into. So uh, these days we have a data-driven, but also a techno solutionist focus when it comes to finding solutions. And Ben Green, he wrote a book about the smart enough city. He mentions the tech goggles and he says, well, basically when we're looking for a solution, we only use tech. And uh, that is founded in two beliefs. The technology provides a neutral and optimal solution for social problems, and that technology is the primary mechanism of social change. But as I said, it's a techno solutionist focus. So when we go into the desirability um, question, we need to zoom out a bit and we need to address the necessity of the project. So 
what is the current status? Why is it undesirable right now? Maybe things move too slow, it's inefficient, it's too expensive. There is, there is a need for change, obviously. And then we need to address what kind of goals do we want to achieve? There, these are our objectives. And then we need to address, well, what kind of means could help us get achieving those goals? And of, of course, that's where data or, and or the use of algorithms comes in. But I think it's very important when addressing the ethical question that you also address the techno solutionist focus and maybe map out all the alternatives, like also analog alternatives uh, to achieving the goal, because then you maybe get a better picture of what is uh, happening and what is desirable. And maybe there, there are solutions that are less intrusive, for example, might be, but you never know. Okay, so that's um, about um, uh, the first part of the desirability question. And the second part, it's about uh, public values. Um, and this is basically the ethical framework the council asked for. Um, and it's based upon the values that Rathenau defined and also by conversations we had with the municipality of Utrecht and also based upon my own research and practices. So we defined seven values and their key phrases, and we use these values in a reflective dialogue in order to address the ethical issue from different perspectives. And all the values, they have key phrases in order that we all understand what we're talking about. So I will shortly address them. So autonomy is about that the people of the city can freely lead their lives. People at the center, it's that people are not treated as a data set, but as a human being. Privacy is that people are not affected in their privacy and uh, the municipality borrows the digital data of citizens. Safety it means that the people of the city feel safe in the city and within the municipality. In control means that the people of the city can trust that the municipality is in control of the technology that is used. And justice means that the people of the city can trust that the municipality chooses a technology technological solution that is beneficial for everyone and sustainability means that the municipality opts for a solution that is beneficial for environment and climate so we set up a list of questions for each of these values in order to have a conversation and of course not for every project have all values are relevant so along these values you can have a constructive dialogue and an in-depth dialogue and um uh, as follows, exploring how these values relate to the needs and the rights of the citizens and other stakeholders, which is also a very important part of um, the ethical reflection. Um, uh, Alex, are there any questions yet? Sorry, I had to uh, look it up. No, not yet. Uh, I was on the wrong screen. Uh, but there is one coming in right now. Um, <laughs> This is a, a more general question, perhaps. Uh, isn't the next step that we connect up smart homes and other kinds of smart pro uh, products uh, in order to uh, implement uh, the smart city uh, um, concept? And uh, what would those ethical risks, or what would the ethical risks be if we would do that? So oh. is, <laughs> maybe we can we can can keep this one on hold and we'll do it later. Well, I can shortly say something about it. Yeah, because, that's good. Uh, uh, at the municipality of uh, Helmond, there is a, um, uh, the Brainport Smart District. They have a, they want to make the most the, the smartest neighborhood of the the world, I guess. Um, they are experimenting with these kinds of questions. So, for the one who has been asking this question, you can look into. Um, um, uh, Brainport Smart District. I guess that's uh, a good one to look into if you have this question. And I wrote an article about the ethical implications. <laughs> it's on eBestuur. And there, another really interesting question just came in, and I, I would like to give it to you. You use the term borrow. To, so the, the, the council borrows data from its citizens. And the question is, how does uh, the user get its data back when at the end of the borrowing period? Yes, well, borrow is more 
symbolic uh, use of the word. So it's uh, we used the word borrow in the key phrase um, uh, in order to, well, data ownership is a very complex question, uh, as uh, Michael also addressed. Um, so it's not something you can give and get, get back, but it's more like a reminder to the municipality that the data uh, comes from someone, so from a citizen. So how would you handle the data if you um, imagine that you borrowed it from the citizen? So it's more metaphorical kind of speaking than that you really borrow it because that's not how data works. Thank you. Okay, I will continue then. Um, and I will show you a little bit about how um, uh, ethics uh, works within the municipality. So we had a threefold uh, question from the council, um, and this is what we made of it. So we have the ethical values and the procedure for ethical conversations for new projects, as I just showed you the essence of it. Um, and how do how does this part um, connect to the other parts, like for example the ethical committee um, and um, the type of processes that, it, that are needed to make data ethics happen within the organization. So this is how we see it, see it. So we made a procedure for the ethical conversation and the ethical conversation procedure can be used, of course, by the ethical committee itself. And the ethical committee is an uh, external advisory uh, committee for the executive board. So for the major and the elder man. The ethical committee, the, they have a role also in creating awareness um, and also in um, training expertise within the administration, because within the administration, there are, there are ethical teams who work and uh, who work on uh, advices and um, make data ethical reflection happen within the administration. And they have dialogues based on the ethical values with project leaders. And I will show you the next slide because maybe it gets more clear. So I'm sorry, this one is in Dutch. So this is how the how the, all those elements um, uh, connect to each other. So on the left, we have the ethical committee and the ethical committee gives solicited and unsolicited advice to the uh, collegia, so to the executive board, which is the major and the elder man. And um, the administration, which is at the bottom, the administration also uh, has their own ethical procedure, which I will show in the next slide. And a very important part of it are the ethical team members. The ethical team members are basically ethical ambassadors within the organization that help giving shape to a project plan and uh, reflect with the project leader on the ethical implement implications <laughs> of the project so they uh, and their product the result of that dialogue is an ethical advice and the ethical advice is uh, collected by the ethical committee uh, in a way of moral prudence so you probably know the term jurisprudence and like jurisprudence is a collection of rulings by judges so we know how legal concepts like laws are translated by judges in a specific context and the same goes for moral prudence so it's a way of creating a learning organization. So the ethical committee collects all the advice by the ethical team and the uh, ethical committee itself uh, to make it easy to use and learn from previous advices within specific contexts, uh, context, I should say. So then there is a procedure within the administration, like how would the ethical reflection take part within the organization. That's the basic question here. It's also in Dutch, the slide, I'm sorry. So first of all, there is a new project coming up and there is a project leader and a project lead, he asks for advice. There's a coordinator of the ethical team members and he will set up a team, a group of team members from within the administration and the ethical team will have a conversation based on our procedure with the project leader. And then the ethical team will make an advice uh, based on that conversation and the advice goes to the project leader and the head of the sector and i'm very aware that the way i present it it seems to be uh, a linear process uh, but i must say uh, and that's also what we uh, uh, experienced within the validation sessions 
The result, results of the ethical reflection are often a set of recommendation and actions. So a lot of information need to need to be collected. Um, things need to be sought out. Um, so this process seems linear, but you often have to go back a, a couple of steps and then, um, for example, have a question uh, addressed on a specific value you need to go into uh, deeper. So um, then when the advice goes to the project leader and the head of the sector, they decide what to do with the advice. And then um, the advice is also collected by the coordinator of the ethical team because it should go back to the ethical committee. Um, this process takes part in about three weeks. Uh, it should not be longer than three weeks. And of course, I can imagine that you question, okay, so how is this connected to the data protection impact assessment? Because when you are working with data, you, of course, you have to reflect on how to use data, what the impacts, what the risk is, risk is and that connects, there's an overlap with the ethical uh, reflection I just proposed and with the procedure we proposed. So this is how we see it. Like uh, about the same time that the ethical team has a conversation with the project leader, the data protection impact assessment procedure starts. And um, we see basically the data ethics uh, reflection as groundwork for the DPIA. And it's, it's funny to say that in their uh, recent report, the uh, Dutch DPA also encourages to extend the DPIA um, with ethical questions. Uh, that it was in our in their smart city report and in Eindhoven we intertwined the processes and we did it like this <laughs> it's still a tick to box uh, because once there is an advice um, formulated by the ethical team um, the advice uh, there will be asked for within the DPIA so one of the first questions within the DPIA is uh, has there been uh, uh, asked for uh, ethical advice and what are the insights of that advice that are necessary to know or to use within the DPIA. So this is a way of not doing double work, using the data ethics reflection in order to, well, prepare the data protection impact assessment. So it's uh, the, kind of like a check question within the DPIA and then using the information collected within the ethical reflection process um, to use for that for the DPIA process. Okay, this is um, what I can tell you about uh, Eindhoven right now. Thank you. And Alex, are there any questions? Yes, there are some really interesting questions. So I'm going to uh, uh, throw them up to you. Um, first, one question of my own also. Um, how are stakeholders involved in this process? Because I saw it, this is really a very internally organized process too. Uh, it's, at least it appears to me like that. Uh, so that was one question. Then I had a question. Um, shouldn't this ethics committee also serve the council? Shouldn't it also have a kind of dual role? Otherwise, the council is always kind of behind on ethical knowledge. So should they not also be supported by this group? Um, another question that was really uh, also interesting is um, uh, how does the council react to the complexity of digital technology? Uh, and this is also a bit related. So how um, are they able to comprehend all the, 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 the nuances and, 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 and complexities in relation to the uh, uh, technology that is going to be implemented? And, and on top of that, how does that relate, of course, to the ethical uh, nuances and complexities? So uh, are they able to, to get a grip on that? And also um, uh, one question is, of course, project leaders have different assignments. Uh, they need to uh, bring uh, projects together. Um, will this not uh, negatively impact um, the way uh, or uh, the, the ethics assessment is done? Uh, how does this relate to one another, the, the fact that a project leader needs to deliver a project? Will it not be one of those things that is done on the side or just uh, as a check mark? I think those are some of the questions and maybe uh, we'll see if uh, I'll give you these now and then we'll see if there's more room. Okay, a, a lot of questions. <laughs> so uh, I will just 
uh, go through them. So first of all, the, the question of the stakeholders, and I guess uh, that's uh, mainly about addressing citizens within the project. Um, um, we're, we're now in the designing phase of this implementation plan. And once the council will agree and um, uh, it will be implemented, we will look into how to involve citizens. But it's a very, it's very necessary and uh, I guess also important to hear what citizens have to say about uh, certain digitization projects. So that's something we need to look into further, but it's, it's, it is uh, on our agenda. Um, the, the second question is a very interesting question, actually, because it was also asked by the council. Um, like, does the council, um, um, uh, does the council need to have direct access to, uh, to the ethical committee? We now, we have now chosen that it goes, uh, via the executive board. That means. Uh, the, uh, the council can always ask for ethical advice by the ethical committee, but uh, they, sh they should ask for advice via the executive board. And that's also to not over ask the S executive board. And, 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 the, and most important it is because we don't want to, the ethical committee to be um, an extern geweten. <laughs> I want to translate it, but that the that the ethical committee will be the ethical authority within uh, the city and the municipality that has not to, that, that, that cannot be the case. So everyone needs to make their own um, decisions and weigh the, 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 the several values that are involved. So that's uh, that's a very important one. And it comes up within a lot of uh, municipalities, like what is the role, the role play between executive board council and the ethical uh, committee. Um, another question was about uh, the council and if they get grip on the techno technological uh, project, if they have, I guess, enough knowledge on the subject. Um, I think that's a very hard question. It's uh, what I learned is that a lot of um, uh, well, and this doesn't is not about only about Eindhoven, but a lot of politicians are very busy uh, uh, training themselves and reading upon this uh, these matters. Uh, we worked in Eindhoven with um, a working group from the council, so we took them along in all our steps. Uh, but I guess uh, within every organization, and this is not only. Um, for the for municipalities and smart cities, but in every organization, I think the ethical reflection goes hand in hand with a digital literacy program. So you need to work on knowledge of how the technology works, or what kind of algorithms are there, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the ethical um, implications of those technologies. You cannot have a good conversation on the ethical implications if you do not understand the technology. So that is that is a concern, but I also see that it's addressed. Um, it's addressed. <laughs> and then um, the last question I heard was about project leaders and that they have different assignments. Um, and and uh, yeah, the crowding out of, 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 of original project goals uh, in relation to uh, ethical uh, assessments or uh, the project leader, of course, has an interest in, com in, in finalizing and, and finishing the project. So what kind of commitment and what kind of energy is put in um, in relation to uh, doing these ethical analysis? Yes, well, um, the project leader um, has to do the ethical. Um, so th there we have uh, made the process for the ethical reflection. If the project leader makes use, use of it and uh, has a final advice, he has to, he or she has to discuss that advice with the head of the sector. And the head of the sector is, is the one responsible. So if the advice has very strong issues and concerns, um, well, then there, I guess the conflict of interest isn't really there because they have to look into the project, back into the project again and look if they can uh, or, or, yeah, alter the, the, the original plan or maybe make adjustments, adjustments in order to make it work and uh, take away those concerns. 
So I guess this question is a little bit about conflicts of interest of the project leader, uh, but he or she really has to, um, well, I guess, take responsibility, but also um, be accountable. So if you don't follow up that advice, you have to explain something. I hope this is a, a full uh, answer to the question. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we're almost at the end uh, of the uh, hour that we have for uh, uh, for this webinar today. Maybe one more short question. Um, how does it? Uh, how are you going to deal with uh, um, situations where the DPI and the ethical assessment give different outcomes or different uh, recommendations? Is there uh, something to uh, weigh these two uh, different advices? Well, I guess it's important to, to note that the ethical advice won't be a go or no go. So uh, there will be actions and uh, um, uh, uh, implications addressed, and it gives an overview of all the ethical concerns or issues or benefits. Uh, and the DPA is more risk based. So it's, it's a kind of an, another angle. So I don't see where these might um, be conflicted with each other. I guess uh, it's more that they uh, connect with each other. And I guess, well, I, I don't see a problem arising here so far. In, the, in practice, we, uh, uh, well, no, we didn't, uh, it, it didn't occur. You haven't had a peer that said uh, go and an ethical advice that said, no, this is unethical. Yeah, but it, but it's it's never a no. It's like this is maybe not a good idea. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. <a> no, <laughs> uh, because the answer to the ethical advice is always like the the action and the decision is always followed up uh, after the advice. So there isn't in the advice itself a yes or a no. It's only what to do next. Um, and what kind of concerns are there? And is there a possibility to mitigate those concerns or alter the project in, a project in order that it is uh, in some way ethical to, to proceed further? Okay, so it's more the advice how to, how to move on and address these uh, issues that they yes. have found. Yeah, and it could be that it says, well, in this form, you shouldn't proceed, of course. But then there will be uh, given points of... Um, uh, well, that can maybe can be adjusted in order to continue. Okay, thank you. I think we're almost uh, finished now. It's 59. Uh, I would like to thank all the viewers who watched this uh, uh, webinar, and which is part of our masterclass. Thank you very much. <laughs>